doing this is Stuart Overman, Overman with the law firm, and we are pleased to have Jan Keller with us today on our industry podcast. For those of you who don't know, we are very privileged to have the best of the best in the industry on our podcast, and this gives our clients, our listeners, a great opportunity to learn from the best, learn the secrets of the trade pick up a couple nuggets along the way. We all know this is a very, very tough industry. And whenever we can have someone of Jan Keller's quality and experience, why I, that's just more value added to our to our listeners. Jan, good morning. How are you? I'm great this morning, Stuart. Thanks for asking. Well, for those of you who, who don't know you, let, let me sort of give, give, give our, re, our listeners a little background. Um, you are a very experienced uh, dental practice management consultant, and you are very, very well respected, I know, by your peers, down the earth, result-oriented programs, and you've been in this industry about 30 years, and I'm sure that you've seen the trends, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and I can't wait to, to hear you know, what you have to say knowledge-wise, and, and you've got you know, clinical and office experience, and you're a software trainer. And I know that you have highly customized uh, development and, and education programs. And I know that, that you are a leading uh, speaker also um, in the industry. And also, for those who don't know, you are a published author. Um, you have articles and books that appear such in blind spots in dentistry and forensic hiring, which I can't wait to hear um, more about. And I know you've... you've have information on Dr. Bicuspid, Dentistry IQ, the Progressive Dentist, and it's amazing what your qualifications are, and I know that our listeners are going to be unbelievably informed once you get through, and, and so I know some of the organizations that you belong to, um, the Institute of Practice Management, and the Academy of Dental Management Consultants, and the Speakers Consulting Network, the American Association of Dental Office Managers, and the American Dental Assistance Association. I know you lecture um, all over the United States and international platforms. And i like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for joining us. And I know that what you have to say will be invaluable to our listeners. Well, the pleasure is all mine, Stuart. It really is. And we're going to be talking about a topic that I am just passionate about and love. And I think there's a lot for... Uh, dentists and small businesses to learn. Yeah, I'm not sure who's going to learn more, your, your, the listeners or, or me. So it's going to be a toss-up because I'm going to take a lot of notes. Okay. And uh, I, I always gain in, invaluable insights whenever you know, whenever we do these podcasts. And um, so, you know, with, with this book, I, I, I love the topic. I love the title because one of the most interesting parts of the practice is hiring. So, Tell me about this this forensic hiring. How did you come up with it? And what does it mean? Tell me about that. Well, forensic hiring, I <clears throat> well, let me I'll go back. A couple years ago in Chicago, I was with some colleagues, Debbie Castagna and Virginia Moore and Dr. Dan Castagna, and we were discussing my um passion for helping offices hire the right people or put the right people in the right positions in their practice. And I was looking for gems, if you want to think about it. I was, like, thinking about uh, the gold and the diamonds that we could find. <clears throat> but when I had put the four processes together, clarify, screen, select, and integrate, it relates to CSSI. <laughs> I happen to be a CSI junkie. So Dr. Dan Castagna asked me if I understood that the music that they use on CSI by The Who, mm -hmm, who are mm -hmm, you? Mm -hmm. And it clicked for both of us, and he is actually the one I have to credit for coming up with forensic hiring. Because for me, it's like clues, putting all the different clues together. And I am a CSI junkie, NCIS junkie. I play the game Clue. I love <laughs> myth <Network. laughs> You know, I want to figure it out. I want to find those things, those puzzle pieces for me are exciting, and I think that um, practices need to apply it, apply the process, 
Um, and I find that the selection and the screening process they do, but they don't do their clarification and they don't do the integration. So those are the two pieces that need the most work. Now, what, what the term forensic hiring, what does that mean to you? What, what does that mean to you? It's, it's like uh, taking all of the clues during the process. It's like looking at every little piece um, deciding in the beginning who we are as a practice, who we are as a um, an, an owner, an employer, what our core values are, and deciding what it is that we're looking for. Who are we looking for? So it's who are we, and then who are we looking for? And then developing a really clear picture as to who that person is. And with that, and once we have that process done, then the screening and the selection is a lot smoother when you apply a couple other pieces that go along with that, and then developing the orient, uh, their integration and orientation into your practice. So for me, it's those are pieces and clues and, and things that I look at on the resume, things I look at on applications, things that um, during a telephone interview or whatever those processes are that we're going to apply, it, they're all clues to me. So clues just mean I'm using an approach and I'm doing it forensically. I, I want to think of bringing out my microscope or my, um, <laughs> you know, the, the thing that I can look through the lens and look at very closely pieces of information to to identify the best candidate for my practice, so. You know, we, we I think you and I are very fortunate in a lot of areas. We have clients throughout the country. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, some clients or dental clients are bigger and smaller um, and others, and we are very fortunate. We have we have to work within different practice areas. And why, why do dentists and, and small businesses, why do they have such a hard time finding the right people? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it laziness? Is it just not listening to things that they should be doing? Why do they have such a hard time? I think a lot of it is um, their chosen field did not give them any of this in their um, learning process on how to hire people. They just know they want to be a dentist or they want to be a chiropractor or they want to be a vet. And they know they need someone to answer the phone but they're not looking for anyone in particular. They just are looking for a body. And we end up with bodies in the morgue. <laughs> right, right. That's the way I look at it. And those people, you know, come and go, and there's a revolving door. So if we apply a specific process, we know we can find the right person to fit the need of the practice. And most of the time, dentists notoriously are looking for a body. They just want to replace somebody. They're not yes. looking for anyone in particular. It's like, I have a need and I need to fill it. It's like having an opening in their schedule. They have 10 minutes. I need to find a patient to put in there. Right. No, we need to look at what it is we're looking for. And let's be very specific. And so that goes back to that first step in the process of just clarifying a lot of stuff. Who who are you? What are your core values? What competencies are you looking for? What's that job description? Job description is it written <laughs> down so right. that you have something to base the whole process on? Um, you know, I, w whenever I speak, I, I do this thing called the top ten mistakes that dentists make. Um, and it's sort of a broad stroke of, of some some common themes that that, we, that I see, but in, you know, in your experience, you're down and dirty in these practices. You're you've been the office manager, you've been in there clinically, you've done the software training. Um, what do you see in your experience in 30 years that you've that you have in the industry? What are the most common mistakes that dentists make in the hiring process? Well, again, it goes back to having that clear picture because for me, it's always at the start. It's needing that foundation. It's that rushing that they do to just fill a spot and they hire emotionally. They're not doing their homework. They're not prepared, first of all, to go into the process and they don't ask the right questions. They do a lot of talking and not allow the candidate the opportunity 
to do 80% of the talking. And that's preparing and having the right kinds of questions to ask during that interview process. And they don't know that. Most I have, a, I have a funny story. I have to share this with you because I do when I speak. I usually share it on the platform. I had a dentist who called me, and I'm going to not use real names. I'll use <laughs> Dr. Dr. Smith, as we say. <laughs> 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 he, he called and he was very upset about a new hire that he had and, and he would call me and want to discuss it during you know a coffee break or whatever and and his frustration and his and his team was ready to mutiny and jump ship and and I I finally just said to him you know because he would say to me well she told me she could do this well she told me she could do this well she told me okay did you check her references did you check out what she was telling you was the truth i mean did, well no can i do those things wow. yes yeah, can wow. do those things and then the bottom line was i finally said to him i said why did you hire her and he was very embarrassed and he said because she was cute wow i just wow. like okay <laughs> I don't know how that works for you, but it's not working. <laughs> so it's let's look at it in a Gosh. different light. And I said, I bet you, if you follow this and we go through this process, in the end, you'll be much happier. And he did follow it. He had to hire a practice administrator. He followed the process. We worked together. I coached him through it. And he called me and he finally called me. He said, you know, Kate is so great. And I said, oh, I'm so happy for you. And it was very exciting for him and, you know, whatever. And then he says, and Jan, she's cute. That made me happy. Uh, I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, the cuteness isn't how we look visually. You know what I mean? The cuteness right. comes with who we are as a person. Now, now it, dentists are notorious for delegating things to everyone in their office mm -hmm. and sort of being hands off. And, and honestly, a lot of times they'll put their, their head in the sand. When should a dentist be involved in the hiring process? Is it in the beginning? Is it later? What what point do they get involved um, from your experience would be the best for them as, as, as a whole? Well, I always believe they should be in it from the beginning, but do they delegate certain parts of it? Absolutely. They can have their office manager do the telephone interviewing, reviewing the resumes after we've determined what it is you're looking for, right? Um, they can, but they need to be involved in the face-to-face -face interview. They're the boss. They're the owner. They need to know this person and whether they're going to fit. I think they should delegate having skills assessment to the team, allow the team members to test the skills out of the applicant, depending on the position and the practice. Um, and that's a whole other thing, working interview versus skills assessment, which we can talk about. But um, And then doing the reference checks, the doctor needs to do it. He needs to have that conversation with former employers. And I really caution people to not answer any questions when the telephone rings, get a phone number, and call it back, um, and not to allow the team to answer any questions even if they're innocuous. It just is not a good thing to do. You know, Here's a question. You mentioned it. skills. Now, mm -hmm. in your opinion, is it better to have the right skills or to be a good fit in the practice? A good fit. The right person with the right attitude, you can always teach anything to. That's a fantastic. <laughs> you know that. It's the, you know, if they have the attitude of uh, I can do and I will do and I, what can I do, that person is going to want to learn and want to aspire to something greater and is going to be a great support for your practice or your business. And you can teach them skills or get them the help to, to teach them what they need to know. So, I so what, what do you I'm tell your doctors um, stepwise to ensure that they have a successful hiring outcome? <laughs> what steps do they need to take? Well, they don't want to rush the process. They want to take their time, but more importantly, they want to be prepared in the beginning and at the end to help that new employee be the best for your practice. 
Um, they, they just need to review everything along the way. You always go back and review. When you're um, a, an investigator, you, you go back and review and go over your clues over and over again until you find the right fit. You don't just choose the first one that comes along. So, uh, yeah. Well, do, lot of, do, do you recommend like a joint interview with the employees or have the dentist take the point? And then what happens if you have a long-standing employee who doesn't like a very qualified candidate? Which yeah. which way do you go with that? Oh, that's always so tricky, isn't it, Stuart? I believe that the team should be involved. It shows um, new candidates or a possible new employee that you value your team members and their opinion matters. They should be involved in the process at some point, either um, interviewing, you know, doing the pre-interview, sitting in. I never recommend a doctor sit and have an interview alone, especially, you know, if it's female uh, to male. You want to have someone in the room, but their role is to just sit there, take notes, and listen, not to in, um, interfere in that conversation. I mean, if I'm in there, I don't interfere unless I'm asked to. But I want the doctor. Do you actually sit in in interviews also for the dentist? Hmm. Do you actually yes. sit in the interviews with the dentist at times? Yes, I do. Sometimes they ask me to come in. Will you be here? We have a, a list of questions that we have prepared ahead of time that we're going to be asking our candidates, and I let them do it. It is this is their job. This is their business. But I will be there to support and coach them if they choose to. So, but their employees can do the same thing for them and, and be there for them, right? But the doctor is the one who need, needs to make that decision. And unfortunately, sometimes we have controlling people in the office that anyone knew is a threat. Any change is a threat. And I can't allow that person to deny bringing on the best person for our job. We may need to coach that person on how to communicate with the new employee or coach the new employee and how to communicate with that person. Um, one of the other things I do is a communication assessment if asked to, which is a way to find how a person has reacted to certain situations in the past because their past behavior and the way they communicate when dealing with people, problems, and processes is an indicator of how they're going to communicate those same things in the future. So we want to look at that information as well. And I think that's a key point in our selection process is using some kind of communication assessment survey. Now, what do you do when, when and, we, and, and we've had this before, and the doctor says, well, my my office manager has the final say-so on all hiring decisions. Is that a recipe for disaster? can be. <laughs> it can be. Um, I know we like to trust uh, the people that we've had with us, and I think it's great that we have uh, long members of our team that have been with us for years, but sometimes they become very territorial. And... Um, are uncomfortable. Um, there's so many different factors that go into that uh, story. You have to look at the bigger picture of the whole business and what's going on. I like to look and have um, team building days if possible with a team um, prior, maybe have them all do assessments so we know their communication styles. I think sometimes we don't understand who we are. I, a lot of times we'll have the doctor take the assessment um, just because I want to know. Tell me about your assessments. Tell me about that because I, 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 I think that's fascinating. Tell me, tell me about your assessments that you do. Well, I use uh, a product called uh, Drake P3, which um, is an assessment or a survey that uh, team members, doctors can take. And it gives me not only how they deal with problems, people, their pace and their procedures, but it also indicates for me their social intelligence and how evolved they are. And that's something we can work on, how they make their decisions. And there's a lot of different reports that I can generate, uh, manager to peer, peer to peer, 
which will help the um, employees communicate with each other who has to flex and be flexible and how to do it without um, destroying the other person's communication style. You know we don't all communicate the same way. However, different positions in the dental practice, we all have similar uh, styles if we're office managers or communication styles. We usually fall within a certain range in certain areas. Um, hygienists are the same way. They're usually uh, pretty high in their procedures. You know, those things are important. And so just looking at it from a multiple level, for me, that's, that's a key. If I'm involved in the hiring, I would insist that we do the communication assessment. If I'm not involved in the whole process, it's something that would be offered. But, you know, that's up to the dentist to then or the doctors to choose to do it. So there's one publication I want to touch base on that um uh I, I want to know about the bot the blind spots in dentistry. Tell me about that. Tell me about that publication. Well fascinating <laughs> title by the way. Thank you. I <laughs> <laughs> I believe that we all have our blind spots when it comes to things that we do. <laughs> and because of my um, being in the business for so long and seeing so many different uh, areas, um, it was a way of reaching dentists and letting them know, you know, have you considered having your own board of directors? And do you have a board of directors meeting on, you know, Monday, you know, you know, the last month of the of the year or whatever. Um, but actually, the person who gave me that uh, inspiration was Linda Miles, another icon in our industry. My last name is Keller. <laughs> and we always talked about all these different processes that dentists, you know, lack in. So to me, it's a blind spot. And she's the one who said, did you ever think about using this as a vehicle or a way to write? And I hadn't, but then I tested the waters on a couple people and publications and Dr. Picusp had picked it up. And so I've written several things for them over the years. So it's a trademark of mine. <laughs> and um, I just think that there's areas that we can discuss that are you know, overlooked in dental practices or, you know, they might not be opening the door all the way to really observe what's happening. And that, right. of course, is many processes that happen in a, in a business, right? So. That's, yes, yes. Is there, and I know, guys, I, I could probably talk to you for seven hours and, and, and take, take notes after notes after notes. Is there anything you want to add um, that we haven't really touched with that, that you think is, is one of those nuggets, although everything you said is a nugget today, honestly. Um, any additional nuggets that, that we can you know, give the doctors who are listening and, and, and thoughts or concerns, what you may have to help them out? Well, I think for them, the, it is key for them to actually just sit and do that clarification process first. You know, by the way, it is, we don't create an ad and just put an ad in the paper, you know, I need a full-time person. When we look at um, and clarifying what we're looking for, who we are, who we're looking for, what the job is going to be, we then can create a very interesting ad to replace the person that um, we're looking for. You know, we, it it is, you know, create something Great, not not just the you know full time person. Think of um, if this ad were put in there as if I was the person wanting to replace myself in a job. I think those are so neat. You know, to <laughs> why do I want to find someone to replace me? I'm moving to the other side of the country. Let me tell you how great this practice is. You know, create something that's and then using core competencies when you are looking for someone, making sure, I don't want um, six, I had 600 applications at one ad for a client once because she put her own ad in the paper or on Craigslist or wherever she put it. And my email was shut down because <laughs> of having 600 things come into me all at one time. So when we reworded it, we got it down to like a hundred and then we can get that down to 20 people and then we can get it down to 10. It's then, you know, we, I say it's like weeding a garden. 
you throw out all the things that are, pull out all the weeds and you leave just the little buds. And then you start working with the buds until you find the two flowers that are going to be for you in your practice. I know that's a different kind of analogy, but it's the same thing. I'm looking for certain specific things. So having the doctors and the team sit together to discuss those things and creating that is key. That is the one thing. But then also during their process of hiring, they need to have open-ended questions, not subjective questions, not yes and no questions. They need to ask questions like, um, um, a key to communication is making sure your point is clearly understood. Tell me a time when you had to convey a complex idea in a brief period of time. What was the situation? What was your approach? What challenges did you face? What was the result? You know, asking questions that they need to elaborate on during that process gives you a better clue as to who they are and whether they're a fit for you. I hope that makes sense. That's absolutely powerful. That's absolutely powerful stuff. That's, uh, yeah, I can't tell you how many notes I'm taking for for my side. Asking those questions, what I want to call the W questions, what, when, where, who, why, and then how, but that's not a W except for at the end. So, you know, it's asking those questions and allowing the candidates to make those. If, If doctors can prepare those kinds of questions for their interview, they'll have much better success. Well, you, you, you provided some unbelievable information today, and, and um, given your reputation in the industry, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you on today, and I know our listeners um, will just come away with a lot, a lot of things. Uh, if someone wants to contact you, how do they get a hold of you? They can check out both my business Facebook page, or they can do my website at uh, www.jankellerconsulting.com. And if they want to, for a short period of time, I'm going to have my forensic hiring ebook on my website that they can go and pull down if they choose to. They better hurry up with that offer, right? <laughs> yes. That's, 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 that's kind of last type of thing. You know, <laughs> yeah, you can't be, you can't give away that kind of material, right? Well, you know, I just think that sometimes, you, and you know, in this industry, the more you give, the more you get. And yeah, I just true. believe in giving back to this industry as much as possible. It's been good to me for my entire career. I started as a chairside assistant, and I think I've come a long way. <laughs> 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 I would say you have. That's for sure. That's for sure. Well, again, I, I thank you for your time and, and it's enormous information. And I know our readers, uh, our listeners rather, will be um, uh, listening to a lot of information and taking some great notes and applying a lot of great things. Um, we'll go ahead and conclude the um, podcast. Um, and again, I thank you for your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, and it's always fun talking with you. 